Uh, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody had their coffee, I hope. Yeah. Um, so my name is John Alvin Wilkins. Um, I have been doing web development since before there was a back end. It was just front end. It was HTML stuff back in 1993 when I got started. Uh, the Paleoithic era of uh, web development. Um, I, I want to start out by, by thanking uh, the Drupal Association and ImageX. Um, uh, I live in Taiwan, and uh, I wouldn't be here today if uh, I didn't get sponsorships from, from both of these uh, great organizations. Um, Drupal Association flew me over here, ImageX has put me up, um, and I've been doing some, some work for ImageX. Um, actually um, started my first Drupal 8 project finally, just like a month ago, and um, started porting Zen to uh, Drupal 8, uh, thanks to ImageX. So uh, thank you very much. Um, today, we're going to talk about six easy pieces for the new front end development. Uh, I assume everybody read this session description. Um, I, I always like to try to push myself when I write session descriptions um, because it's months in advance, and uh, um, I, I didn't quite get all six easy pieces finished, so this is more like four easy pieces, two actually quite hard pieces that I didn't finish, and one crazy new idea about Drupal and Drupal components for the new front-end development. Um, uh, <laughs> so I guess the good news and bad news, besides that, uh, I didn't start the slides until this morning at like 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I um, got a little distracted. I released a new version of KSS node, a new version of, uh, what was the other thing that I released? Oh, oh yeah, uh, Zen 7.x 6.0 is also out now. Um, and uh, that means that we're actually pretty much gonna be doing mostly live demos today. So uh, that's actually the good part. So um, let's jump straight into this. Um, where are we going? Like front end development has been like really crazy. Like all the different things that can happen. Um, and uh, I, I want to thank the Drupal Association again. This, this uh, is actually the uh, stock photo that came with the slide deck, um, and it, but it's a perfect metaphor for my opening slide here. Um, you know, just sort of goes off to the edge of the deck, or the edge of the dock there, and you know, where are we headed? Um, there's so many different things, right? Um, you have NPM, you have Gulp, you have Grunt, um, you have performance regression testing, you have uh, performance budgets, um, all these different things. It's really hard to figure out where you're going. And um, that's what I wanted to talk about today, right? Um, give you strategies um, for um, figuring that out um, and also give you some sort of hints for um, maybe what the next steps that you want to take um, as you learn about you know, this, this sort of brave new frontier. What are, what's the path that you want to take so you don't run into you know, dragons and, and crazy mermaids that look like upside down fish. I don't know what that is. Um, so, I think everybody here, you've been doing front end development. Like, is anybody completely new to front end development in here? Yeah, yeah. So, like, we've been doing front end development for a while, right? Um, it, and, and, if you haven't started doing some sort of the new stuff, I mean, we, we all have been in the old selector hell land, which is you know, where I certainly have been for a very long time. Um, and we still learned a lot of stuff while we were there, actually, right? Um, so I just wanted to like go through that super quick and remind that we have learned actually quite a bit and we're not starting from scratch. And those lessons that we learned there are super, super important, right? So. I want to talk about the five pillars of front-end development. These are sort of like the, the five most important things that I think really inform us of how we build our, our front-ends um, today, right? And, and they start off with, with three that we've learned since way back in the beginning. Progressive enhancement, where you are, are, um, you're providing a, an experience to every single person, right? And if a browser, a particular user has additional capabilities, you extend and give those extra capabilities to those extra things instead of like providing broken versions of it to everybody else. Only the people who are able to see those extra bits or capable of doing those extra things 
get those things, right? So like uh, mobile first responsive design is a perfect example of, of, of progressive enhancement, right? You, you only have the this one column display that goes to mobile devices and you know, multi-column spread across the page for larger devices, right? Um, and, and these are priority order, really. Um, but progressive enhancement also implies accessibility. Right? This is really critical. Um, providing, it's not about trying to like, accessibility is not trying about talking about trying to remove barriers, right? You should be providing access to everybody. It's all about the access that you provide to people and those progressive enhancement things, those default ways should be accessible, right? The extra things that you add, that you give to additional things should not be barriers. You need to make sure that the extra things you provide are not barriers and that they are also fully accessible. Right? Um, and then front end performance, right? We need the things to be fast as possible because you start downloading, you know, 100K images over and over again, you're just really slow and people don't use the site, right? These are the most critical things in front end development. Um, and I wanna add two more on to the end here. Um, reusable components, right? Um, I started talking about this uh, a few Drupal cons ago. Um, and uh, being able to create a design um, and have that be completely reusable in various places on your site is the sort of first thing you should be doing when you're learning the new stuff in front end development, right? Um, and it's so important that I wanted to put it on my five pillars here. And then finally, automation. Now this one's gonna get like Morton riled up because he's not a big fan of automation. He's been driving him crazy recently. Um, but I think that is super critical because one through four there are, that's a lot of stuff, right? We're responsible for a lot of things right now. And the only way we can do them correctly and not break stuff all the time um, is to start doing automation, right? So you have an automated task that like does all the stuff for you so that it's done correctly every single time. And this is really critical if you have like a CSS bug on production, like, ah, oh my God, ah, right? Running an automation script that builds all the CSS, does aggregation of JS, does all that stuff for you correctly when your brain is freaking out because of the bug on your homepage, <laughs> that's why you need automation. So, uh, five pillars of front end development. This, this, is, this is something that I've been thinking about this spring and, and uh, I just wanted to put it out there um, to remind us that this is what we're talking about, right? So the first three things are the things we've been doing traditionally for years and years and years, decades even. Um, and then the second two are the new, th new stuff. Um, so how do you go about learning all these things? How do you go about deciding what's the next thing? Um, I, honestly, I think it's sort of important that you find your own path, right? Don't have somebody dictate to you what's the first, second, third thing, fifth thing that you have to do next, right? Finding your own path is critical. I love this picture, by the way. This is awesome. Like waves crashing everywhere, the storm's going on. She's like, yeah, I got this. Find your own path, okay? Um, and while you're learning new things, um, what are some strategies for, for going about and collecting those, those new skills First off, steal, right? Go, go find somebody else who's done the thing that you're interested in and take from them. Right? <laughs> and then iterate over it, because it might not be exactly the way you want to do it. So feel free to you know, change it slightly, try it out that way, change it again. Going over this is fine. And then in testing. Testing is going to be something that's going to become more and more critical um, just across the board, right? So make sure you test it, make sure you know, colleagues test this stuff. You can find that, oh, it works great on my machine, doesn't quite work <coughs> on the actual production side or something. Test these things. Um, and then share, right? I mean, it's easier to steal if everybody else is sharing, so please be considerate and share your stuff at the end of this process so that I can steal from you, okay? <laughs> Um, so now we're going to get into, you know, my 
four component or four uh, pieces and uh, two that aren't actually done and the other crazy thing. Um, and I told you to find your own path, but really, this really should be the first thing. The second, third, you can decide what you want to do, but the first one really should be the component. Um, I've given an entire presentation to just this. Um, and in fact, there's a URL down here at the bottom here uh, that is a, an example uh, of a component. But a component is basically, it's a single thing which contains HTML. In Drupal 8's case, it's a twig file. Um, some CSS, uh, if you like SAS, I do, a uh, SAS file, and some JavaScript. And it encapsulates an entire chunk of design, and that chunk of design is in the CSS, and it applies to the HTML that's in the component as well. And if it has some sort of JavaScript requirements, that JavaScript is all together, you know, put it in a folder, collect it, like that's the component. Right? And it's completely repeatable. So you should be able to use it in multiple places on your site, no matter whether it's a node in one thing or a, some sort of other entity in another drupal -y bit of the site. They should be repeatable. You should be able to use them no matter what, how it's built. Um, and instead of having the god-awful high specificity selectors with really long Drupal selectors, um, we're replacing that CSS specific specificity with very specific class names. So the specificity is quite low because it's a single class name, um, but the, the name of the class is quite specific. So it's not going to, it's going to be you know, self-contained and not bleed into anything else because you're not going to accidentally add that same class to something else. Um, and nestable, right? So a lot of times um, these components will have other components inside them. Um, that's, that's what you want, right? Um, here's where the part of the demo comes. I'm gonna jump out over to Firefox here. So this is the Flower Power one, this is a URL. Um, I'm gonna post all of these URLs as a comment on the session page, uh, so you don't have to like frantically try to write down all these URLs. Some of these URLs are quite long. Um, but the, here's the Flower Power. Um, this is a real HTML and CSS components. Um, I'll show you here in the inspector. You can see, oh yeah, right, I got it mirrored. Um, <laughs> here, so this div is our flower uh, component. So I added a flower class. Um, it is a complex component, so it has multiple divs, um, including petals and face and stems and leaves, right? So, You construct these um, using those sort of class names that I showed, and this this site actually talks about, uh, shows you all of the, the the names of the classes that you use and how a particular component is, is structured. And I'm not going to go into that detail because, like I said, I did an entire presentation just on this. Um, but yeah, here's so this is a variation of our component. It's a, it looks like a tulip instead of a, our daisy. Uh, this is the sort of desktop version of the site. You can see it's got great hover effect going on there. This is the print styles. Um, yeah, here's, here's some extra HTML that this particular component has, so it has a flower bed. Um, and um, if you know Smacks, there's a skin in, in the Smacks as scalable and Oh man, I've forgotten what that your, that stands for. SMAX, S M A C S S, scalable and modular architecture for CSS. There we go. Yeah. So there's a skin is one of them. Um, this is the you know at night skin. Whoa, that really doesn't show up there, does it? Looks great on my screen. If you want to come around this side. <laughs> um. So. Um, and, and if you go to that URL, which is actually what we were just looking at, um, at the very beginning here is a link to that presentation. So the videos for that, and it goes into quite a bit of detail about how you actually construct a component. Um, this is uh, super critical, writing your CSS using components, Drupal 8 using chunks of twig that uh, are inside the components. 
that's the first thing you should be doing. Um, but then everything else is whatever path you want to take. Right? So let's talk about the twig, the sass, and the bug. Okay. Is Morton in here? He's not. Okay. So um, this name, I'm, I'm sure if you're as old as me or, or possibly younger, you might know that there's a movie called uh, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Fantastic spaghetti western. Man, highly recommended. I, so I have to show you a little video clip here. The good. The bad. <laughs> Can you believe I did this this morning? <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so the fugly selector. Um, I talked about components, right? So like component basically means that you have a specific class name that you need to put into your markup, right? But we use Drupal, right? <laughs> and sometimes it's really hard to put the class exactly where you need it in the markup because Drupal sucks. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and this, is, this is a really good example. So like um, a, a lot of times like nodes or comments, um, they'll have a link inside the title, right? And getting at the actual A tag in there, it, it's like, really hard. Um, so instead, I, I use SAS in this fugly selector technique. Right? Um, so I, I honestly think that SAS is almost required to, uh, to use when you're using Drupal. You can do this with, with plain CSS. Um, it's a little bit trickier. Um, but basically here, we have the, the ugly selector. Is that mine? Oh no, that's, that's your weekly updates here. I'm going to close that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I have a phone down here that's uh, t t transcribing uh, everything that I say, and it's uh, beeping. Um, I put my phone into airplane mode for that very same reason. Um, I, I did a presentation um, two years ago, and uh, my wife, who's in Taiwan, uh, called me during the middle of the presentation. Uh, she had no idea what time it was, so uh, I always put my phone into airplane mode. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, sorry. So. <laughs> The selector in the DOM that I can't change because it's Drupal and I can't figure out how to change it. So like this is the best that I could do. Um, I was able to get a class onto you know, the title wrapper div, or the, what is H2, right? Um, but I couldn't get into the link. So I write the, that ugly selector in the DOM that I couldn't change, and then I use SAS to extend into the class name that I wish I could have used, right? And so what this means is that I end up with rendered CSS, that has the beautiful class name, comma, and then the fugly selector. Um, this technique works really well um, because it, it's, you would think that you wouldn't need to do this, you could just you know, write it by hand, but when I start writing CSS by hand and have fugly selectors all over the place, it's really hard for me to concentrate on writing the component the right way. And this makes it really easy. So I'll write the component the right way in SAS at the top of my file, and then at the very bottom, I'll just like have a bunch of fugly selectors if I, if I need them, right? Um, so usually when I, this is my, it's not my last resort, um, but I will try for like, you know, maybe like five minutes to try and figure out how to get the class in there, and then I'm like, bah, and then I'll write a fugly selector, right? So. Noodling with JavaScript tooling, tooling. Um, so, all of the, the new tools for front-end development have been written in Node.js because it's JavaScript, right? I mean, we've been using JavaScript since the very beginning. Uh, Netscape 1.3 or something like that had added JavaScript. Um, and uh, it's very natural that once somebody created this Node.js thing that was all JavaScript, that front-end developers would flock to it and start writing their own tools instead of waiting for the damn PHP developers to get off their ass and do stuff for us, right? Um, so we're doing it for ourselves. We're writing it in JavaScript. Um, and that means that we need to learn a little bit about the Node.js ecosystem in order to install these tools and use them, right? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that, is, I don't know. 
It's okay. It's not popping anything up. I'll just uh, ignore it, I guess. Or can you mute it? Can you mute the audio that's coming out and then? Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> You think it's my laptop is doing it? Or I can just pull it out. I don't need the audio anymore. You good? Okay. It might be my laptop, I suppose. Um, okay, so. Uh, I wrote this uh, quick start guide for NPM um, because I didn't understand it when I first started using it. Um, and then once I sort of felt like I had a good handle on it, I, I wrote this uh, quick start guide. Um, we're going to go through this real fast. Um, so if you want to have, want to use one of these tools like ESLint, which is a linting tool for JavaScript that will tell you about uh, code style bugs and that sort of stuff, uh, you need to actually install that software and the way you install it is using npm, which is the Node.js package manager. Um, here we are in the quick start guide. Um, and you need to uh, install Node.js, I'm not gonna show you that. Um, but one of the things that I wanna talk about is this concept that npm has, which is installing things globally versus installing things locally. So when you have Microsoft Word, when you have Microsoft Word installed on your computer, you have it like a global version basically. So like there's one version of Microsoft Word that's on, you missed it, Morton, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there, you have one version of Microsoft Word, so like the latest, well, I don't even know what the latest Microsoft Word is, 2014 or whatever they call it. Um, and if you have like a Microsoft Word 1.0 document somewhere in your, you know, folders, you can't open that file anymore because you have a newer version of Microsoft Word and it can't understand that really old version. So it would be nice if like you installed a new version of Microsoft Word inside a folder where you're like working on some new, new files and then you had like the old version of Microsoft installed in the directory that had all the old files, right? So NPM works that way by default. So if you want to use the latest and greatest uh, ESLint and JavaScript tools on the new project, you install them and you get all the new versions. And if you have an older project, when you first installed them, you can tell NPM like, okay, I'm using the latest versions you know, a year and a half ago. And then you set it up so that it always remembers that these are the versions I'm going to be using. So you can come back to an old project and continue to use the same versions of the tools that you're using originally. This is super, super convenient and is probably the reason why Morton has so many problems because it's not doing it right. So that's why I'm going to continue to figure a way to do it right. So, um, so if you have like a completely empty directory, let's go over here. The first thing you want to do is do npm init. Um, this is going to create a package.json file. Um, let me show you what that looks like super quick. Um, it's just a JSON file that lists all the tools that you've installed. Right? So we're going to create one. Um, it's going to ask you some things. Um, so yeah, I'm going to do that look good. That looks good. Keywords. Uh, Ramey Morton. <laughs> I said, oh, GPL, please, yeah, 2.0, uh, yeah, that looks good, okay. So, uh, there we go, Kirby Morton's still on there. Um, and uh, I've already actually, uh, you know, created this file, that's why it, it just added a couple things to it. Um, but it will add, it will create this folder for you, in, or this file for you called package.json inside the directory where you are. And then as soon as you do that, um, you can start adding software. So uh, npm install, <coughs> uh, like ESLint, 
oops, I want to show you the right way to do it. Save dev eslint. Um, and this will tell my package.json that I want to use this eslinting tool um, for my development work. Right? And uh, that's what the dash dash save dev means. And it will chunk away there for a while, hopefully not too long. Um, and it will add <coughs> this line inside my dev dependencies, right? And what this means is that I can go uh, and, and every time that I, every time that I run npm install later, if I come back later and I don't have any of these uh, stuff installed, I can type npm install and it will install all these things. Um, yeah, the, this is why I'm gonna get control. So where does it actually install it? So there's a node underscore modules directory that it creates when it actually starts installing stuff and everything gets installed into this spot. Um, the nice thing is that if, uh, and then <laughs> NPM people do this all the time, they'll delete that entire directory and then just run NPM install again and it'll re-download everything. The thing that you'll wanna do, and this is the bit that I think you somehow missed, um, is that once you've installed it on your computer and you have everything working, you want everybody else on your project to also have the exact same versions, not basically the same versions, the exact same versions. Um, if we look at this, it says, uh, there's a little upward caret dot 2.9.0, and basically this says, uh, install ESLint 2.90 or higher, as long as it's not you know, to 3.0. So less than 3.0, but 2.9.0 or higher. This can cause problems if you, you install 2.9.0 and your colleague actually gets 2.9.4 and something about that causes you know, slight differences and weird bugs uh, between the, the two of you developers. Um, so the fix for that is to do what's called npm shrink wrap dash dash dev. And again, this is all documented in this quick start guide. Um, and it creates an npm shrinkwrap.json file. And while the, the package.json was very sort of general, like, oh, yeah, 2.9 or better, that's fine. npm shrinkwrap is like super anal. It is like this exact version is installed and these are the dependencies and these exact version of all these dependencies are installed and it's quite long. I mean, it's really anal. Um, yeah, so all of this stuff was ex installed exactly. Add this to your Git repository and then when your colleagues go into this directory and type npm install, they will get these exact same versions as well. Right? This will save you so much headache. Um, so, what are some reasons, so uh, we talked about how globally versus locally and how NPM does local by default. Why would you want to do global exactly? Um, and the reasons come down basically is I want to be able to type one of those, you know, one of the things that I installed just like right here. Um, the problem is is that since it's installed inside node modules, my command line doesn't know that there's a binary hiding inside node modules for me to run. So the actual thing that I would need to type is node modules.bin.eslint, and that's just really annoying. <laughs> um, so instead, um, what I recommend to do is you can install this super handy uh, tool called um, npm run. Now, npm run, you should install globally. But as soon as you do that, um, you can now type the npm run command from anywhere. Um, and if I type es, uh, ES, eslint, oh yeah. This will be using the exact version that's inside node modules uh, slash dot bin. And I can prove it here by doing a which eslint? And you see there, it's actually grabbing the ESLint that's installed inside node modules slash dot bin. Um, so N npm run is fine to install globally. Um, there's very few other things that I would install globally. Um, Grunt and Gulp both have uh, 
a solution to this problem that you want to have the newest version of grunt in this project and a older version in that project, but you still want to run the command grunt rather than npm run grunt. So they solved this problem. Both of them solved the problem the same way. You can do npm install dash global grunt dash cli. And basically this is a wrapper that does the same thing that npm run does. So you, when you install this, you can run the grunt command from anywhere and it will look for the actual local version of grunt and use that version on that project. Right? And same thing with gulp. It's the same thing. So you install gulp cli and then as soon as you do that, you can run, I've got gulp installed on here, you can run gulp. Right? And it's actually using the local version that's installed here rather than the, the in fact, if I go outside of this directory where I don't have anything installed um, and run gulp here, it's going to be like, now I, I couldn't find a local version. I can't, there's nothing for me to do. Um, so. and that, uh, I think, is everything about NPM and it save, save, yeah, yeah. So that's a quick intro to NPM. And now we'll go back to the slides. Sh should we run the video one more time for Morton? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's good. It's it's worth a, a rewatch anyway. <laughs> okay. Oh wait. The twig of the assassin of ugly. The good. The bad. There you go. <laughs> okay, so that's NPM. The next piece here is style guides at the center. Um, I've also given presentations all about style guide uh, centric development. The, the Los Angeles uh, session last year, um, I talked about style guide centric development. And basically, what this means is that. Um, you know, we talked about very briefly how you write a component. Well, you have a whole bunch of those together and now you have a component library, right? And wouldn't it be nice if you could run that component library through some sort of tool that generates a style guide that uses the real HTML that's in your component library and the real CSS and shows it all inside a style guide for you. And because it's using the real CSS and the real HTML, it's always up to date, right? I first used style guides in like 1996 and they were PDFs and they were wrong when they gave, gave them to me, right? They were out of date immediately and eventually I started telling designers, stop giving me style guides, they're useless, give me a Photoshop file, right? They, I mean, the idea is great, right? Document your design system, but keeping that documentation up to date was impossible unless you had an automated tool that creates a living style guide. So the tool that I like to use is uh, KSS, um, and uh, I'm gonna give you a quick demo about that. So, uh, KSS is, is two things, basically. There's a specification that talks about how you write the documentation and KSS likes to keep it really simple. Um, you write a, because usually you do most of your work inside a SAS file or a CSS file, you write your documentation in that file and it's just a normal SAS comment or a normal CSS comment. So uh, the syntax for it is like ridiculously simple. The t first line is the heading, like the name of the component. Um, and then like some text that describes it for as many paragraphs as you want. Um, then if you have variations of that component, you describe the class name that you need for the variation and then space dash space and then describe that variant. Um, you can also here, you can use, if you have hover um, styling for that particular component, you can specify it this way. So I would just sort of, Hover style, right? So that would add 
that would show in this dial guide, it would show you the hover styling. Um, and uh, then you just uh, tell it where the HTML markup is. Right? So I'm keeping, uh, for Drupal 8, I'm keeping my markup inside a twig file, right? surprise. Um, and then the last thing in the KSS comments is a style guide reference, which is, it's basically, it's a hierarchy that you define however you want. Um, so when you're navigating through your style guide, you get to decide what the sort of top level categories are, um, and then what the subcategories are, and where inside your categorization this particular component goes. And I've decided that uh, I've got a main category called components, and this messages um, component is just being listed next to all the other components that are under this category. So components dot messages goes into the style guide this way. And um, I can do npm run kss is the, the name of the command line tool. Shows me all the different um, command line options that I can use. And this, this totally works. If I typed it in, it would, it would look through the source files. I pointed at the, CS, the SAS files, which have all these KSS comments in it. I point it where I want the style guide to be built. Um, and it just generates it. Um, because that's a lot of typing, like all the different options, I have all that saved inside um, a gulp file. So, uh, and we're, we'll talk about uh, task runner is, uh, in a sec. Um, but I just need to run gulp, and it will go through, and you can see one here is, yeah, style guide. So it did the style guide task, and it parsed through that, and made, scroll down to messages, here. And to prove to you that it really did actually generate it just then, let's see. Whoops. Rerun gulp. <coughs> so it's really easy to keep your style guide up to date. See, there, actually it says hi, no <laughs> um, And uh, I have a watch command. If I run gulp watch, and this is basically the same thing except that it's sort of continuously watching all the files uh, that I told it to, and I don't even have any little audio plugged in this time. But I guess you guys didn't hear it, so that's right. I can mute my computer. There we go. Um, so it's watching now, and that means that I can change this text. And it noticed the change and started doing the build. And if I go back over here and reload, it's automatically updated the style guide. Right. Um, I really, 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 really like style guides. Um, and the documentation for KSS spec is, I forgot to load this URL first. Oh, come on, Wi-Fi. Well, regardless, I, I, I will post the URL for <laughs> the, the spec that describes uh, how you write KSS. Um, and um, I'll post it on the, the actual page for the session. Um, okay, so one of the nice things about having a style guide like this is the way it completely changes the way that I do development, right? Um, I can build things in the style guide. I don't have to wait for the backend developer to implement it in Drupal. Right? That means if I have designs, I can, or, or if I don't have designs, I can start working with the designer and start building them with real HTML, real CSS, 
and it gets generated into the style guide, and I can do that independent of the backend developer. And then when the Drupal feature is actually done in Drupal, um, somebody can go back in and <coughs> wire it all up, right? Add the classes that you need, make sure that the HTML is actually being output by Drupal. And then it doesn't even have to be the front end developer. Like I worked with uh, some people before and I did all the stuff in the style guide and the back end developer came in and like, oh, this is the classes and this is HTML, I know how to do that. And like, he implemented the Drupal part and all I did was the style guide. This is crazy amazing. Um, this, this approach of using a style guide has really changed the way that I do development of Drupal sites. And uh, it, I, I had a boff at, uh, after DrupalCon Los Angeles and uh, people just kept coming up with even more and more ideas about why this stuff is so great and uh, <laughs> it's, it's just amazing. Um, the, the style guide, because it's documentation, you can sort of uh, document all of these sort of accessibility things that you have. So if you are a uh, public institution um, that is, you know, more and more of them in the US are being sued because they, their sites aren't completely accessible, you can build documentation about accessibility into your branded style guide and be like, use this or else, right? All of these things are become possible because of the style guide. I love style guide centric development. Testing for success. So this is the, the, the piece uh, number five that I didn't finish. Um, regression testing um, is a great concept um, and I still haven't quite figured it out so I'm hoping somebody else figures it out and like, actually there's gonna be, is there a session on that at, here on regression testing? I know that, that immediately after this session there's going to be a boff um, at, right after lunch actually. Um, and yeah, there it is on style guide and visual regression boff. And uh, certainly people are gonna be talking about that there. Visual regression basically means, you know, I've, I've made a change to my CSS and it takes a screenshot of before and after and compares them and it's a wonderful tool and I wish I knew how to do it. <laughs> Budgeting for performance. Um, there are some really cool tools that basically allow you to say, I want to have a specific budget about how many kilobytes, basically, a particular page I can download before you know, I've violated my budget. Like, it's basically like saying, I want to be 165 pounds and no more, um, but I want you know, the weight of my home page to be you know, 200K so that it loads in however many point seconds. And you define those things and you can actually track those metrics um, day to day, um, and as you make changes, and uh, uh, sitespeed.io seems to be a really great way to do it. There's a it's open source. There are uh, non-open source um, ways that you pay uh, programs that allow you to do this without quite so much setup um, that are also available. And like I said, those are the two bits that I didn't get done. Um, let's see here, we got 15 more minutes. So let me show you the golf file. So uh, to go back to JavaScript tooling one more time, um, all of my tasks, like when, when would you need to start using a task runner? Right? Um, if you have like one thing that you're doing, you don't need a task runner, right? So if you uh, are only using SAS and it compiles your CSS and you're not doing style guides, you're not doing anything else, you're not doing linting, you don't need a task runner because you're only running one command, right? But as soon as you do like two things and you have to run two commands in order to you know, get all your changes made and up onto the production website before your boss kills you, uh, then you need a task runner. Um, and the task runner basically allows you to, to have one command and it does all the things that you want it to do for you. Uh, Grunt is a great task runner. Gulp is also another one that's uh, sort of up and coming. Um, I use Gulp and um, this is how you do it. So the very beginning of my gulp file.js, this defines all the tasks that I want to do inside my project. This is the one that comes with uh, the, uh, the Zen theme. Um, we're looking at the, the Drupal 8 version, but uh, Drupal, like I said, Drupal 7, Drupal, sorry, Zen 7.x 6.0 came out this morning, 
it has a gulp file in it, and all these things are set up for the starter kit uh, in, uh, for Drupal 7, and it looks very similar to this. Some paths are different, basically. Um, and it starts off um, by defining some options. This is just a regular JavaScript object, and it's full of uh, the paths that are, you know, where I keep all of my different assets, my SAS, my CSS, um, <coughs> and I've just sort of defined this myself. And then once I get past all of these options, here's where um, the, the sort of task-based part of my gulp file starts. Um, and requires a Node.js contract. It's a function that will load in these, these optional modules yeah, into your uh, JS file. So we're loading up Gulp. Um, we're loading up some other things. We're loading up KSS um, because, of course, that's the thing that generates our style guide here. And then here's our first API call, gulp.task. This is a, the task method on the Gulp object. And it's basically is defining a, the task. The default task uh, basically means when you, when you type gulp and nothing else and hit enter, it will run the default task. Right? So the default task in this case is defined as uh, a list of dependencies. So my default task depends on this build task, um, which means I need to run the build task before I run the default task. So there's nothing else on this line, which means that our default task is basically a null task that only does the dependencies. So it's going to do the build task. And if we scroll down here, we will see the build task. And this is slightly more um, involved in that it has multiple dependencies. We have three different dependencies. So before the build task starts, it will start the styles colon production, the style guide, and the lint task. And it runs all three of those at the same time. So all the dependencies get run, all those dependency tasks get started at the same time. They run concurrently rather than sequentially, which means that it's pretty darn fast. Um, let's see where our styles production task, let's look at that one. So here is uh, the third way that you can use, or the second way that you can use gulp.task. We've defined the name of it. Uh, the fact that it has a colon there is just a way uh, that I stole is a naming convention that makes it really easy um, for me to sort of organize my task names. So the colon there is just a convention. Um, and it has its own dependencies. And then here is a JavaScript function which defines the task that I'm actually doing. Um, and now we'll start to see some other Gulp API calls. Gulp.source, basically that means um, I'm going, I have uh, a SAS files variable that I created that lists um, all the SAS files that I actually want to read. And this gulp.src will read all those files and then start piping it into these pipe calls. So um, if you're familiar with Unix, uh, pipes, uh, this is the exact same thing. Not many people are though. But basically it, uh, it reads all the files and then it passes it along to the next thing in the pipe. Um, and the things that are in the pipe are gulp plugins. Right? So here we're using uh, SAS. We're using node SAS, um, which uses the libsas uh, compiler, which is written in C and is much faster than the Ruby SAS version. Um, and uh, it passes those raw SCSS files onto SAS, which then compiles them. Um, then I pass it on to the auto prefixer gulp plugin, which goes and adds uh, vendor prefixes to the beginning of all the CSS properties that I need, uh, depending on which browser I've decided I want to support. Um, then it shows like the size of all the files. So for example here, let's, let's uh, Gulp styles production. You can see here, so it's listing out all of the files that it actually generated and the file size. Um, I, I really like having the file size listed there because then if I see something that is like 36 megs, oops. <laughs> um, and then the last thing, the last sort of API call in Gulp is gulp.dest, which is destination, and then it basically just writes all those files 
into this new directory that I specified. So gulp source reads the files in, gulp pipe pipes it onto the next plugin, gulp.dest writes it to the, the directory you specify. Um, there's only one other gulp API command, and I will have taught you the entire gulp API, um, and that is for watching. The watching works uh, just slightly different in that instead of uh, gulp source like reads all the files and then you know passes it along the pipe, um, gulp watch uh, literally you just point it at the files and instead of reading it in, it just watches it and says, "Was there any changes? Was there any changes? Was there any changes?" Uh, and then if something happens, uh, so this is the list of files that I'm going to watch. And then again, we have like some dependencies, right? Well, these dependencies, they don't get run before the gulp watch. They get run when a file changes. So if one of those files changes that gulp watch was watching, it runs these other tasks. And that's it. You've learned the entire gulp API. You are able to, theoretically to write your own gulp file now. Um, that's one of the things that I like about gulp.js a lot is because it is very easy to learn. And I would pull up the URL here, but I'm sure that it won't load. Oh wait, no, I already loaded up, yay! <laughs> so uh, gulp.js is on GitHub, um, github.com slash gulp.js slash gulp, um, and they have a link to their API docs, and I will put a, post this link on uh, the session description and you can see here, this is the entire API docs, gulp source, and uh, do, 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 options for gulp source, gulp destination, gulp task. More options, more options. Gulp watch. Somewhere in there is pipe, but I must have missed it. That's it. Those are the only things you need to learn in order to write your own gulp tasks. Um, and just to show you that I, I really, really believe in that whole, you know, steal, iterate, test, and share. Um, if you look at the bottom of my gulp file, um, I've listed the places where I've stolen from. <laughs> and then of course, this file is, comes with Zen, so you are, I'm sharing it with you. <laughs> and I've gone through lots of iterations and testing on this. Um, so it works quite well. Um, feel free to modify it to, to your own needs. Um, yeah. Um, so that is uh, the last little bit about uh, JavaScript tooling that I wanted to talk about. <sighs> Which means that I don't quite have time to talk about the one crazy idea about Drupal 8 and Twig components. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you two minutes and then I'm gonna have people ask questions. Okay, so. So what's wrong with Drupal 8's HTML.twig files, Morton? Yeah. So, <laughs> so when, you, when you're building a component, right, uh, Drupal insists that you have certain file names. So like no dash dash event dot HTML.twig is a common name that you have. The problem is, is that file name is not a component. It's a Drupal thing, right? So the file name is completely wrong. Um, the other thing is that Drupal forces me to put all of my Twig files inside the templates folder. And because I build components, uh, because I build components where like I have HTML and my CSS um, and my JavaScript all together, that means I have like everything inside templates. So like the directory is wrong too. Uh, and then once I open up the, the once I open up the uh, HTML.twig file, um, it's full of these crazy variables like content.comment or con content.field. whatever, you know, image, right? That you drill down to these things and like I would never name variables like this. These are, they're really, they're Drupal specific. Um, they're awful. So, I mean, besides you know, like the file names, the directory names, and the variable names, they're fine, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I started to build the Zen theme in Drupal 8 about three or four weeks ago. Um, and I've come up with a technique 
where you don't have to put everything inside the templates folder. Um, you can put your components in a components folder. And the, the twig files that you write are vanilla twig files. The variables that are inside those vanilla twig files are whatever you decide the variable names are. So you get to write twig exactly the way you want to without worrying about Drupal variables. And then inside those godawful .html.twig files, which are still hiding over there in the templates folder, um, I end up basically just calling my component twig file through like a include. So I will include my component or an embed and I'll embed my component or, or uh, what's the third one? Um, include, embed, and extend, right? So extend, right? And then I can, have, I can have twig blocks inside my twig files and then basically if I've got a whole bunch of drupal -y variables that are all shoved together, I can put that inside a twig block, extend, and my component is written very nicely, clean, vanilla JavaScript. And the best part is that my style guide builder, KSS, knows how to read vanilla twig. It reads the real twig files that are inside those components and builds the style guide using the same HTML. So the style guide has CSS, a real CSS. It has the real twig HTML. <coughs> and Drupal is consuming the same thing. There's no like fancy footwork going on. You know, Drupal reads that file like normal and KSS reads that file like normal. No, no fancy gulp things going on. It's just reading the same file. It's really nice. And I'm gonna have a boff on Thursday that's sort of talking about this idea and sort of us asking for volunteers because I've only just sort of started this conversion over. Um, but we can talk about this, this idea in general. And this is, this is the thing that I'm talking about with everybody. Um, yeah. So, questions. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions, come up to the microphone. If you're really hungry, feel free to leave. <laughs> okay. Is the microphone on? How do you I, how do you add the JavaScript to the style guide to use the JavaScript from that component? Right. Um, so so KSS has options um, to specify which CSS you want to include in the style guide and also which JavaScript you want to include. Um, so you have to basically specify. If, for example, in my gulp file, I'm writing all the uh, options for KSS to tell it like how to build the style guide, and I just have to specify the name of those JavaScript files. Is a little bit manual right now. I would like to automate, and I have like a gulp task, so I should be able to like automate in some way. Um, that's like one of the next things I'm going to be doing, actually. So, it, mm -hmm, yeah, and and the thing is, is that each of these components in Drupal 8, uh, basically every single component needs to have a library, right? So that means like I have this giant libraries folder for the theme and I, every single component has to have it its own entry. That's a problem that, that I'm actively working on with, with Wim Leers and some other people to figure out how do we automate that bit so that we would have to, like Morton was just complaining about, oh, my libraries.yaml is so long. Um, is the mic working? I think so. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's, uh, I guess, more of a comment. So thanks for mentioning the, uh, the style guide and visual regression workflow buff at one. Unless it moved, you might have gotten the room wrong. I think it's in 291, but it's somewhere. So if you're interested, come join. It's on the buff board. It'll oh, it changed on the buff board? I, I would have hoped so. OK. All right. Well, <laughs> I, it's somewhere. I copied it off of this website like an hour ago or something like that. OK. Then maybe I'm wrong. But it's somewhere, I swear. All right, cool. Thanks. 
Um, I'm wondering about your choice to go with KSS over uh, Pattern Lab. Can you talk a little bit about maybe the advantages you see in that? Yeah, so um, when I started looking at, I, I, I looked at a whole bunch of tools um, before I picked one. Um, Pattern Lab was on the list, uh, KSS Node was on the list. Um, you know, Pattern Lab had the sort of quote advantage that it was written in PHP. Uh, just like Drupal is. Um, one of the things that I wanted to have flexibility with though was to be able to use one style guide tool on any kind of project. You know, I'm sort of flexing my muscles as a front end developer and if I, if I want to be able to, you know, have the opportunity to write an app, I still want to be able to generate a style guide for it. And so I wanted to have something that was slightly more independent of PHP. So the advantage of I, I mean, I basically, this was Drupal 7 when I was started looking at it, and I knew that there was no way in hell I was going to be able to get Drupal to run through Pattern Lab. That just seemed like a nightmare. So that advantage didn't seem like a good advantage to me. So I ended up picking KSS Node, which is a Node.js tool. So it meant, it meant uh, I, I volunteered to become a maintainer of it. Um, I'm the primary maintainer of that application now, and uh, it meant that I got to, like, make my JavaScript skills even better by writing this application. And uh, yeah, it, that's why I picked KSS Node. Yeah. But Pattern Lab is a, a great tool. There, there actually was a session yesterday, oh, they left, um, on Pattern Lab. Uh, you can watch the video on that. Um, wh where's all the sample markup coming from for the style guide? Oh, the sample markup, right, right. So yeah, um, so if we go back and look at my messages.twig file here, lots of SVG, I didn't have to run it through a menu or anything like that, just I'll put it right in the twig file. Um, I have you know, variables here for where the content goes, right? Um, I don't have like sample content, but I, uh, KSS supports this ability where you just, have a simple JS, JSON file, uh, which is a, has the same name as the Twig file, and it reads these in and, and makes variables uh, for each of those things specified in JSON. Right? So it's creating a heading variable and a messages variable, which is an array of strings, and that's how KSS node knows to load that up. Um, there are other ways that you can do this. N I mean, not with KSS, but like there are other systems that have different ways of loading it up. This one was like dead simple, so that's the way we went. Um, Wim was just looking at this and he was like, nah, 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 YAML file. Nah, nah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was just wondering about your kind of opinion on post CSS and it is a tool for workflow. Um, yeah, post CSS is really interesting. Um, I, I want to say that I think Morton would like it, but I don't know if he would. <laughs> um, post CSS is basically, um, it, it comes from the idea of like, you know, all these pre-processes are kind of annoying. We, we should just write CSS, but you know, like vendor prefixes and, and doing, supporting all of these different things which is a primary use case of SAS, um, we can do that in a post-processor rather than a CSS pre-processor. So post-CSS will go through your CSS file and uh, do all the things that you want it to do. That it has like a whole bunch of plugins. So like it has a post-CSS plugin that will like strip all the white space, um, add the vendor prefixes, uh, remove duplicate selectors. It, it's, it's a great tool. Um, I've been using SAS for a while, so. I, yeah. Right. Right. And yeah. Yeah. And and if you saw my, um, if, actually, auto prefixer is one of the post CSS uh, filters, so I'm just using it. Hmm? Uh, I I think so. Um, but I mean, like, oh, I'm using Gulp Auto Prefixer. I, I, think, I think that if you looked at the GitHub URL for the underlying dependency of Gulp 
it would be under post CS or yeah, post CSS. It's under there, under umbrella. When you're writing JavaScript for a given component, um, is it aware of the JavaScript Drupal object, and do you, do you write it using like Drupal behaviors in, in a Dr JavaScript using Drupalisms, or is it more vanilla JS? But then, and, and then is KSS aware of uh, of the Drupal objects? Can, can KSS? Yeah. Right. You can. So uh, um, that. It certainly would be nice if I could write more vanilla-ish type JavaScript and then have this be consumable outside of a Drupal environment. Um, that's something that I might explore and it, or, or, well, love it if somebody else explored it and told me how to do it so I could steal from them. Um, but for right now, I'm using some of those Drupal-y bits still, like behaviors and all that stuff. Um, and you can, because KSS can be configured to load any JavaScript, I, I literally load Drupal's JavaScript inside the KSS doc guide. I mean, the Drupal JavaScript doesn't care what markup is actually there. Um, so the fact that it's run on a KSS doc guide doesn't matter to it. Um, so do you repeat all of the Drupal JavaScript dependency, library dependencies to make sure that you get all of the right Drupal? Yeah, so the, the thing that I just told you was true in Drupal 7. I've only been doing the Drupal 8 bit for, yeah. Um, yeah, that would be a oh, pain in the butt, having to do all the dependencies like go through all the libraries to find the dependencies and then load every single dependency inside. Yeah. Um, you, you can do it manually. It's going to be... Yeah. I don't, I don't have a better answer for you right now. Like, a little, like I said, I've literally only been doing the Drupal 8 stuff for like four, four weeks. We'll, we'll keep sharing and stealing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to talk from what he just talked about. I did this stupid thing for Drupal 8 where I just, I wrote a module and put it into my theme, kind of like Omega does. And then that module, it takes the style guide and puts it into a Drupal page. Wait, I mean, sorry, a Drupal module or like a Node.js module? Drupal module. Okay. So inside the theme, it has a directory for the theme and then one for the module, because you can't do certain things in themes, like make routes. And so it's just, I just made a route and then I use stupid PHP parsing to just bring the whole style guide into Drupal. So I don't have to import Drupal's JS or worry if I'm getting the right ones because it's actually in Drupal. And it's in, it's in GitHub, but uh, um, maybe I'll post it. I'll post a link to it, even though it's stupid. It does work, even though it's stupid. So. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah, it's a really dumb way. If somebody's got a better way, but at least. I mean, so, so KSS node, the new version, which is like 3.0.0 beta 12 or something like that. Um, has a uh, option that you can run, which is uh, extend Drupal 8. And what that extension does is it, it loads some, some like, you know how, how Drupal 8 has some twig extensions, like uh, attach library is a function that you can run inside Drupal twig files. That's not a thing in twig. It's a Drupal thing that it added to twig. Um, but the KSS node then has this option to, basically it just sort of rewrote those, like attach library, I don't, don't actually need to do that inside uh, KSS node. So it's just, it just understands the syntax and then does an error out and then goes, ignores it. So it adds in a bunch of extensions that won't, will cause your twig files to not, you know, die when you run it through twig.js. Yeah, um, though, so, we could extend that idea. I mean, YAML's not that hard to read, so maybe, maybe you could figure out how to like read yeah. all the libraries and then yeah, dependencies. Yeah, it was a and, gulf YAML thing, so yeah, it should be pretty easy. Yeah. I mean, compared to what, but you know, not too hard, I guess. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, um, I'll be up here for a little while. <laughs> um, and like I said, there's a, there is a boff uh, right after lunch. Uh, we're talking about style guides and visual regression tests. And then the Drupal 8 Twix stuff is on Thursday. Thank you.